and thank you for joining us for this dose of virtual vitamin Z. I'm Sandy and I'm an education specialist at the Detroit Zoological Society and I'm joined today by Jeff, our curator of reptiles. Hello everyone. And we are here at the Massasa Eastern Massasauga Rattlesnake Habitat and Jeff and I are going to chat a little bit about the snakes that live in this gorgeous habitat. Jeff, how many um, Eastern Massasaugas do we provide care for here at the zoo? We currently have four animals. We have three males and uh, one female, which is the one that you see in this habitat right here. Look at that. She's right there. How old are the different Massasaugas that we provide care for here? So the female that you're looking at right here, she's about seven years old. Uh, the, we have another one that's uh, four years old, and then we have two others that are three years old. How, um, how much do they weigh? So the one you're looking at here is right around three quarters to a pound. Um, they don't, they'll get a little bit larger than that, but not a lot. Um, they get up to about between two to three feet long. Okay. Most of them are right around the two foot length though, so I mean this is an adult size right here. Okay, and is she about two feet long? And she's roughly right around two feet or a little bit less maybe. Okay. Yeah. I love her coloring. How, uh, what do um, Eastern Massasaugas eat? Uh, so they eat uh, rodents um, that are found in the wetland areas. They'll also eat some amphibians and things like that as well. Uh, pretty much anything that they can kind of find. Um, as juveniles, they'll eat, you know, things a lot smaller and they might even eat some insects and stuff like that when they're first born. Okay. And uh, how does that compare to what they eat here at the zoo? Uh, at the zoo, uh, we do feed them uh, uh, rodents that we get in uh, frozen and we thaw them out for them and feed them about once a week. How often would they eat in the wild? In the wild, it's going to be, it's, it'll really vary, uh, you know, if, if if there's free food like right there in front of them, they're not going to pass it up. So they might eat a couple times a week, but you know, if food doesn't come by for a week or more, well, then they're not going to eat that particular week. So it, it really varies on food availability. Okay, so they they uh, they can fast pretty well. They then. can fast for a little while. Yep. Okay. Can you tell me a little bit about either the snakes' individual personalities or maybe their personalities as like a species? So while some snakes have some individual personalities, um, ours, ours are all kind of laid back. And as, as a general rule, most of the Massasaugas that I've come across, both uh, in working with them in captivity as well as ones out in the wild, most of them are fairly laid back. Occasionally you get one that's a little bit nippy. But for the most part, you leave them alone and they just kind of leave you alone too. Awesome. So where do Massasaugas live in the wild? So here in Michigan, we find a lot of them uh, in the wetland areas and you'll find, you'll, you'll find them not too far away from water in most of their habitats. Um, you know, we do some uh, work in uh, southwestern Michigan in a major wetland com complex and that's where we're finding a lot of them. But even around here in the um, uh, metro area of the Detroit here, you can find them in some of the uh, nature parks, the metro parks and things like that. So that actually leads me to my next question. What do I do if I come across an Eastern Massasauga in the wild? If you come across one, you just kind of stop, maintain your distance, and you can just kind of back away. Um, for the most part, a lot of times you don't encounter them too often in the wild because they can kind of, they can feel the vibrations of larger uh, animals and things like that that coming towards them like if they're on a um, path or something like that and oftentimes when they feel that they'll usually just move away from that particular area um, but sometimes they are startled you know they might be sleeping and you know you kind of kind of came up on them and at that point you know just kind of move and walk around them give them give them you know give them a, some room give them, give them some space that just makes give sense. them some space yep so they are a rattlesnake. Are they venomous? They are, like other uh, uh, rattlesnakes, venomous. Um, however, their bite, I mean, their, their venom isn't like completely uh, toxic uh, to us. You know, we have uh, good uh, uh, anti-venom, you know, if you were to get bit. Uh, basically, you know, as long as you're not messing with these snakes, your chances of getting bit are fairly uh, slim to none. Um, so, but if you were to get bit by one accidentally somehow, uh, you know, just get to the hospital as soon as you can. Just let them know what, you know, bit you. They'll treat you with antivenin. You'll be out in no time, basically. But if you give them space, you probably won't get bit. You're not going to get bit if you give them space. No. So, you mentioned that you do some field work with Massasaugas. Are they endangered? 
Yeah, since 2016, they've been listed as threatened under the Endangered Species Act. And that's throughout their range uh, in Canada and the northeastern part of the United States. And they range in, uh, from the west of uh, um, Wisconsin and Illinois all the way to the east of eastern Ontario and New York State. So can you tell us a little bit more about the conservation work that you've done with the eastern Massasaugas? So this is probably our major conservation species that we work with here at the uh, Detroit Zoo as far as reptiles are concerned. Um, that we, uh, w w along with several other uh, institutions that also hold this animal uh, as far as what's known as a species survival plan, we every single year get together with all of these uh, other institutions out at a field site in southwestern Michigan where we actually do annual surveys of a population out there that we've been monitoring for about, uh, oh gosh, it must have been about 12 years now. And uh, we just kind of do a blitz survey. You know, some years we might just find, you know, 10 to 20 snakes. Um, one year we found close to 130. <laughs> um, it, it's a very healthy population. You know, it's very weather dependent on, you know, uh, how many we find each year for the given week that we're out there. But, you know, we, we catch these snakes. Uh, we uh, we take them into a, a lab setting, and that's where they take blood on these guys. Uh, if they're large enough, we'll uh, put pit tags in them, the same that you would put in your dogs or your cats and things like that, um, just so we know who's who. So that way, when we release them back out into the wild exactly where we found them, and if we catch them again in another year or two or three or however many years later, uh, we'll be able to look back at that animal and you know see what uh, changes and things like that happen. So, and we've learned so much from uh, conservation work like this. Uh, one, of the th one of the neat things that, we, uh, that happened to us uh, several years ago was we had uh, caught a, uh, a female, and she happened to be pregnant, and when we looked back on our records, we had actually caught that animal as a young of the year just three years prior. So at that point, then we found out that, oh, hey, you know, these guys are sexually mature and can breed and uh, raise young at three years of age. So, you know, some very good information that we get from that. And, you know, we can use that information uh, to properly, uh, you know, do different husbandry, you know, uh, methods within the um, captivity as well. So we're learning a lot from the wild counterparts to base bas basically better maintain them in captivity as well. And hopefully we'll get to the point where uh, we can get breeding down to more of a science uh, and at, at some point, we'll hopefully be able to, uh, you know, start head starting programs and be, you know, raise enough to put back out into the wild to assist with populations that may need such assistance. So, so you said a head starting program. Can you tell me what that is? So a head starting program. Basically, you'll take, uh, you'll breed either in captivity or uh, it depends on. There's a couple different types. We've we've done some other ones here um, before with turtles. Uh, mm -hmm. And with the turtles, we t actually took eggs from the um, females that were laying them in the wild, we would hatch them out and then we would raise them up to a certain size and then release them uh, back into the wild once they were no longer quite as susceptible to predators. Um, with the Massasaugas, uh, I know Ontario is looking at a project right now on doing a head starting program. And uh, you know, assuming that that is successful, it's kind of the first one that they've been doing. Um, and we're, as the SSP, we're assisting with that. Um, but you know, as that moves forward and if that is uh, successful, that is something that we'll potentially be doing to where we'll be trying to uh, bolster populations uh, throughout this animal's range. That's really cool. Yeah. Here in Michigan, the Massasauga, their population is actually fairly stable. Um, a lot of the uh, um, individual sites where they're found, they seem to have good numbers, uh, but pretty much all the other states, they're kind of in dwindling. So. We're kind of the stronghold that's kind of, that's for... That's interesting. I wonder why that is. Um, it, you know, it's, it's hard to say. Uh, it could be a lot of, you know, it could have a lot to do with just, you know, the landscape, um, you know, and the different types of uh, wetland complexes and things like that would be my guess. Sure. Yeah. So, talking with you, I've really got, gained a little bit of an appreciation for this snake here. Can you tell me what people can do to help make sure that this species of snakes is around for other generations? Um, well, one of the things that 
uh, most people can do is if you do see this snake, I would uh, definitely recommend that you report it uh, to like either the DNR or most of the states have what's known as like an atlas program or something like that to where they take accounts of different animals, especially reptiles and amphibians and things like that. Uh, sometimes you might even be able, I know Michigan has an atlas app that you can get on your phone. You can download this and then you can report and even take a picture and send that picture in with the report. Uh, and it'll take your geodata from the phone and it'll uh, log that, uh, uh, tag that, and that way they'll know exactly where you saw it. Um, and those are types of information that, you know, are really uh, helpful to us, you know, as conservationists to know where these animals are and to kind of, you know, may maybe we'll find new uh, populations of them around the state and things like that. So that's one of the uh, ways that you can do uh, some, you know, helping out with conservation. Other things, too, is, you know, just they are from wetlands. Um, so there's, you know, times when certain organizations and groups are doing wetland conservation, you know, trying to restore wetlands, get involved with things like that. That would be another way. That's really awesome. Thanks so much for your time today, Jeff. Yes, of course. So thanks so much for joining us for this dose of virtual vitamin Z, and I hope you learned something about our Eastern Massasauga rattlesnake. Have a great day.